All right, good to see everybody here. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was talking to Nikki and she knows about this already. Uh, Wade, I already mentioned the, the title of my lesson, uh, Q&A with Paul. And um, was it yesterday, or a couple of days ago? She was asking me, well, have you gotten with Paul yet? I said, what are you talking about? I said, it's a Q&A with Paul. And we're going to be looking at some questions. She said, I know, have you, have you gotten together with him yet? And I said, no, this is the Apostle Paul. So she was thinking about you, Paul, Paul Wright. So maybe we should do a Q&A together at some point in time. I was like, you know what? That could actually work. That may be a great idea. So you can't be mad at me because it's Father's Day, all right? So um, I thought that was funny. Maybe I should rename the, the title of this lesson. So we're going to be talking about the Apostle Paul and looking at some of the interactions that Paul had throughout his uh, ministry and looking at how Paul interacted with people, questions that uh, Paul was uh, given or Paul asked, I think is a, is a great way to study. And I think it's a great way for us to consider how to interact with other people as well. So it, it's almost like a textbook with how, to, with how to talk to people. Now, since it is Vacation Bible School, I thought it only appropriate since we've heard so many things about young people being put on the hot seat and the classes in the back and things like that that as adults, we can't, we can't be left out of, of all the fun. So I was, trying, I was talking to Nikki about, should we do like men versus women? I got 10 questions, and you guys have to speak. This isn't a sermon. I want to hear from you, all right? So I want to see where you guys are at. Uh, I think we should do that. Let's, play, let's, uh, let's have the men versus the women, all right? So since the uh, um, women are always going to go first, you guys are going to have to answer the first question. We'll just go back and forth, and let's see how many you get correct. So any, any sister can answer, and then the men, when it's your turn, you can answer as well. So let's, uh, let's get started here, and whoever has the most points, uh, you get the bragging rights for, uh, for uh, BBS. All right, let's see if this works here. Okay, sisters, true or false, Paul had a sister. Now, whoever speaks is speaking on behalf of all the sisters. All right, and same for the men, all right? Paul had a sister, true or false? True, that is true. Who knows where that's mentioned? The latter part of Acts, because he has a nephew. There you go, excellent job. Acts chapter 23, turn over to Acts chapter 23, when Paul, uh, there are some who are plotting against him in Acts 23 and verse number 16, but the son of Paul's sister Heard of, their, heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. There you go. All right, question number two for the, uh, for the men. How many missionary journeys did Paul take? Zach is laughing. What is it? You know the answer. Three. That is correct. There are three missionary journeys that he took. All right, so why are you shaking your head no? That's an easy question. All right, maybe some didn't know it, though. All right, so it's one to one. Uh, Acts chapter 13, if you look over in Acts chapter 13, this is Paul's first missionary journey where he's going to leave Antioch with, with Barnabas. And one of the things that Paul would do along with, uh, with others, uh, after each of the trips, they would, they would typically go back to where they started. So in Acts 14, in verse number 26, they went back to, uh, they went back to Antioch and they discussed what happened on that particular journey. The second journey is found in Acts chapter 15 and verse number 36. And then the third journey begins <clears throat> in Acts chapter 18, verse number 23. So there are three trips, and then he's going to make a trip to Rome. All right, so it's tied up one to one. Sisters, can you name five disciples who traveled with Paul? I need five. Five individuals who traveled with Paul. Don't say brethren, that's true, but I need names, all right? So name five. Who can name five real quickly? You guys can do this collectively. Anyone? Nick, give me one. No, just give me one. <laughs> Silas. What's another one? Barnabas. John Mark, that is true. <laughs> John Mark. <laughs> What's another one? I heard somebody, what? Timothy, that's four. Give me another person who traveled with Paul. Luke. Luke. Yeah, there you go. That's five. Very good. All right, brethren. Uh, where did Paul often go upon entering a city? That's pretty easy. All right. The synagogues. All right. Two to two. Sisters. <laughs> huh? 
How many times did sisters was Paul's conversion story mentioned in the book of Acts? Let's get some, I want to hear from someone else. How many times was his conversion story recorded in the book of Acts for the sisters? Any guess? It's three. That's exactly right. So you have Acts chapter 9. Um, you have Acts chapter 22, where he mentions his, or gives his story again. And then you have Acts chapter 26. All right. So everybody is perfect so far. Three to two. Brethren. Oh, no. Uh, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? We don't know. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That was going to be my answer. We don't know. This is working out pretty well for the guys. All right, so it's three to three. <laughs> Sisters, give three examples. Nikki, you can't, you got to wait, Nikki. You can't go here. Three examples of miracles Paul performed during his ministry. Three examples. So, yes, he performed miracles. Can you name three examples of what some of those miracles were, sisters? He raised the dead. I'll take that. So Acts chapter 20, Eutychus. He raised Eutychus, right? That's one. Give me another one. He cast out demons. Yes, I will take that. The spirit of divination in Acts 16. I'm sorry, what? That is correct. Very good. Acts chapter 28. Yeah. Can, all right. Uh, guys, can you think of any other examples, any other miracles? There's one in particular that I'm thinking about during his first missionary trip. You can, but let's see if anyone else has a thought. He was teaching someone, and someone was getting in his way. You guys remember that story in Acts chapter 13? Uh, look over in Acts chapter 13. In Acts 13, <clears throat> verse number 6, there was a false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. And he was seeking to turn, verse number 8, the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. So he performed numerous miracles. So, uh, let's see, two, four, six, uh, right now everybody is tied up here. Whose turn is it? Um, all right, brethren, uh, for the men, why did Paul share his conversion story so much? This is kind of a gimme, because why did he share his story so much? It was uh, part of his, what he preached, I mean, it, it said, if I could be converted, so can you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Paul, it was a part of his story, and I love that answer, right? If, if Paul could be converted, so can you. Uh, you think there could be some room for us as we talk to people to share our conversion story, to share how we came to the gospel, to share what Jesus has done for us, to share why the gospel is such good news for us. There's great application there as well, right? So we don't have to be ashamed of telling people, let me tell you who taught me the gospel, all right? Uh, so great, great pattern for us to follow. All right, sisters, um, who helped Paul to be accepted at the church in Jerusalem? Someone, a sister maybe who has not shared anything. Otherwise, I'll open it up to everybody. So I want you to think about this. Who was that brother who helped Paul? I see... Yes, I see a name being mentioned there. Any, any sisters? All right, Nikki. Barnabas, that is correct. All right, so brothers, you got to get this to at least tie it up. How many times did Jesus appear to Paul in a vision? Hmm. How many times in the book of Acts did Jesus appear to Paul in a vision? This is for the tie. We'll just have to stop here like in soccer. <laughs> Any thoughts? We know at least two, right? We know at least two. Acts chapter 9, that's correct, on the road to Damascus. What's the second one? Encouraged them concerning those in Corinth 
Acts chapter 18. Now, I, I can't be biased. So is that your final answer, or where are you at? Yeah. That is correct. Stephen? He said he was caught up into heaven for a time. And if you know, we think, you know. <clears throat> that, that definitely, I, I would say that definitely was a vision. Uh, that was just in the writing of, of the Corinthians. So more so in the book of Acts uh, with the vision. But that would be a vision as well. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. So. Um, so Kevin is correct. So it's all tied up. All right. Excellent job. So Acts chapter nine, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, the Lord spoke to him. Acts chapter 18, verses nine, 10, 11. Uh, the Lord spoke to him. Do not fear. Do not keep silent, but keep on speaking for there are many people here in uh, Corinth. And he stayed there for 18 months. And then in Acts chapter 23 and verse number 11. But on the night immediately following the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. That's encouraging to me because we may sometimes think about the Apostle Paul and think, why would Paul need this kind of encouragement? Yeah, Stephen. So you say Acts chapter 9 was a vision? Is that what we're saying here? Or that was, that was, he truly appeared to Paul there, right? Yes, you know what? That's, that, that's true, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's correct. Yeah, that's a good catch. Thank you for that. So there would actually be two then. Yeah, it was more than just a vision. Uh, Paul's, uh, Jesus is, he was, yeah, he witnessed him. Yeah, that's good. So say that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's correct. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you for mentioning that, Stephen. I think because that's important with his uh, conversion story and uh, with him being an apostle. Yeah, with him being an apostle. So, so the correct answer would be two uh, in the book of Acts. So, yeah. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. No, that is correct. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah, that's, that's very good. I'm glad you guys mentioned that. So with the visions, you have a couple of visions with Paul um, and, uh, with respect to the Lord and then clarifying that. I appreciate that. That's very important to, to make sure that we understand. So that's good. So we go back and we think about these things. Sometimes we can look at these things and say, well, yeah, you know, was that just merely a vision? But he's appearing to him. He's speaking to him, and that becomes important as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the journeys that Paul had and some of the questions um, that he had. So we're going to look at some of these questions and answers. Um, I just put these slides here, just looking at these maps, uh, partly just to show how much Paul did. You know, in Acts 13, this is where he is with Barnabas, and this is going to go through Acts 13 through the middle part of Acts chapter 14. And so just kind of getting an appreciation of, of how much Paul traveled. Uh, his second missionary journey, let's see here, uh, outbound again, uh, starting here in Antioch, and there's something to be said about how often he's starting there in Antioch. And just notice just how much territory uh, he's covering there. And then the third journey, um, as well, just notice the, the distance and the places where he's going. I think that says a lot about just the amount of, of work that he did, uh, the amount of territory that he covered, how much preaching and teaching. When you think about these uh, journeys, the synagogues that he visited, what comes to mind with some of these interactions that he had? So as we think about some of these questions and answers, can you think of certain conversations that stand out to you? Yeah, Stu. About the court and no, sorry, not Yeah. Yeah. Acts chapter seventeen. Very good. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. What's another one?
You didn't have too many other than, huh? All right, well, let's look at them. Let's, let's, let's consider some of these interactions that he had. I want to start in Acts chapter 9, actually, where uh, Jesus is speaking to him. Uh, and this is just one more slide here with his trip eventually to Rome. Um, I didn't count that as a missionary journey, although he was still doing work and um, preaching even when he was in prison at the end of Acts chapter uh, 28. Um, I want to start here with, with Paul and Jesus here. I think this is important. And really my objective tonight is to simply observe these interactions that he had with people, uh, questions that were asked, how he responded, what was happening, and what kind of application we might be able to, to take away from this. Um, as we think about ourselves, talking to other people, and even observations that we can make um, for others as well. So let's look at Acts chapter 9. Look at verse number 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. So one of the initial interactions that we have with Paul, obviously with Jesus, Jesus is asking, why are you persecuting me? And certainly this is a question that's going to grab Paul's attention. This road to Damascus is going to change everything about his life and about uh, what's going to happen in the, in the first century uh, as well. You think about Jesus and all the ways that he interacted with people. He was always the master teacher. Um, there's not much additional information here, but he's going to make it very clear as he appeared to him who he is and who he was. And this question was for Paul. Um, he's getting Paul to think, why are you persecuting me? Notice a response from Paul. Paul's response is one of humility and one of respect. And there's another uh, portion here in Acts chapter 22, verse number 10. In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 10, uh, actually, if you go back up to verse number 8, uh, Jesus had asked them, Why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. So there's some supplemental information here with respect to what Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you'll be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. So we get some additional information here of Paul after he's saying, who are you, Lord? Asking now, what shall I do? What else is interesting about Paul's reaction is that he's obedient to the Lord. He's been opposing Jesus, and he's been opposing his people now look at his response. He is obeying what Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth is saying. He recognizes and understands that he is risen from the dead. And so as you think about this interaction here, the question, what shall I do, Lord? Jesus is very clear. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And that's interesting to think about as well. Paul had been persecuting the saints. He had been persecuting the church. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you're persecuting me, right? And I think that helps us to understand um, Christ and, and his church as well. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. So we know who was going to instruct Paul. That was Ananias. And we know uh, in Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, there's another question where Ananias told Paul, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So just looking at this first interaction, this question and answer, if you will, where Jesus is questioning Paul, Paul is responding, Ananias is questioning Paul, what might be some lessons we can take away from these interactions? What are some lessons that we can potentially learn for ourselves, maybe even for other people as well? 
Yeah. Like salvation, he, if you take a very literal meaning of the phrase calling on the Lord, he called him the Lord, but he was not saved until he answered the gospel call. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great observation. Yeah, uh, he, he answered him and called him Lord. He was still not saved at that point. Excellent observation. Yeah, that's something definitely uh, we can share with people. What else might we be able to take away from these interactions? What do you see? You know the thoughts? Well, one thought is, just think about Paul. Paul is listening very intently. Paul's not fighting against Jesus. He's been fighting against him for a long time. But Paul is listening, and there is little talking on behalf of Paul with respect to Jesus. I think this is something good for all of us to think about and even to share with, you know, as we search the Scriptures and open up the Bible, you know, many times people have questions, but we need to make sure that we're actually listening to what Jesus has to say, right? Jesus, when He speaks, we need to listen. Uh, As we study with other people, we need to help them to see that Jesus is the one who has the authority, and we need to listen. You know, Paul could have gone back and forth. He he didn't do that, uh, but he was quick to hear. And I think that's something very important for us personally in our own Bible studies, but also encouraging people as well. Um, I also like what Ananias told Paul. One second, where Ananias is very clear to Paul, why are you delaying? You know, as we talk to people, it's okay to ask them these kinds of questions. Uh, What's holding you back from being saved? What's holding you back from obeying the gospel? Nicole and then um, Kyle. Yes, ma'am. It's also a great example of godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we see true sorrow, right? Godly sorrow. Uh, He's going to be praying for three days. Uh, Certainly, he's got a lot to think about uh, before he is baptized after Ananias told him. Good. What else? If there was ever a place in Scripture where you would think Jesus would just tell a man what he needed to do to be saved, it would be here, but he didn't do that. Instead, the role of someone, a man, a human being, telling the gospel message um, was involved here. Jesus had gone to the city, and there you'll be told what you must do, and then Ananias comes to him. Yeah. So the power is in the word of God, yeah. but the deliverance of that message, that gospel message, has always been through the mouths of men. Yeah. Uh, not that he selected for that word, but really he gives us that word <laughs> in spreading of the gospel. Yeah, that's a great point, right? I mean, everything could have been resolved at that very moment, but Jesus, you know, the gospel and this teaching, you know, went through Ananias. We see that with Philip and the eunuch. Uh, The Spirit told Philip where to go. The angel of the Lord is moving him to interact with that eunuch. And so there's that teaching between between men. Excellent point. Tim? Um, He was was one of the most educated people and powerful people of the time. Uh, He lived within his conscience even doing the things that he did, he thought he was doing what was right. Yeah. And so we can, we can do the same thing. We can be going headstrong, thinking what we're doing is correct, but we still have to have our ears open and read yeah. and, and constantly search because I mean, there's, I mean, you may find yourself sideways on something at some point. You're like, okay, I'll fix that. Uh, and he did. He was, he was really far off of where he needed to be, going a totally different direction. Yeah, the humility is so important. And that's what makes his conversion story so important as well. Um, Just who he was in this radical or immediate transformation. Yeah, Mackenzie. Going back to the sermon this morning with why Christianity, this kind of, I think it's a good example of why Christianity now, because like people believe that the Jews are still God's chosen people today. Absolutely. Yeah, that's another great observation connecting back to what we talked about this morning with why Christianity, what she was just saying. He didn't go back to he didn't go back to that, right? Um, you know, he was a Roman citizen, he was a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin, so he understood that. But most importantly, his identity was found in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. <clears throat> Teach others. You know, he, he probably 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he was zealous. I um, can't remember if he talks about that in Philippians chapter 3, you know, with respect to his zeal or First Timothy chapter 1. But uh, yeah, there, there's no stopping him. And, and that's, you can see that this conversion was, was true. And great point for us as well, right? Keep the same zeal. You know, maybe like with Apollos, maybe we just haven't been taught, you know, accurately. Um, and, and yet, you know, if we have the zeal, keep it, keep it, uh, and keep it for the truth. Yeah, good. Okay, let's look at a second example here. Look over in uh, Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, and let's see another interaction that Paul had. Some of these are not necessarily going to be, you know, directly question answer, um, but we can see Paul and Barnabas crying out to the people here. Um, and what we find in chapter 14, verse 1, in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly. I like what the New American um, says, with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. So more miracles. Here's another miracle here in Acts chapter 14 at Lystra, or Lystra, I repronounce it, in verse number 8. There was a man sitting who had no strength, and his feet, lame from his mother's womb, he had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Laconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? And so that caught my attention it's not necessarily a question and answer, but Paul is asking this question, why are you doing these things? And he's going to explain to them, we are not gods. Uh, we're preaching about the true and living God. Look at verse number 15. Uh, we are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, even saying these things with difficulty. They restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So what I find interesting here they're saying something which obviously is not true and Paul and Barnabas are going to make sure that they understand no we are just men just like you this is who you need to follow the true and living God this is how you need to turn away from this sinful behavior so it's not necessarily a true Q&A but Paul is raising this question and as you read this and, and, and listened to me reading this did you pick up any other observations of maybe some lessons we can learn with how Paul responded to this crowd and what Paul is teaching to this crowd. What, st what stood out to you? Any thoughts? We're going to have to move a little bit quickly here. Any thoughts on this? He asked the question. He asked the question. So when you tell people stuff, sometimes it's, it's you telling them it goes here and it just bounces off. When you ask the question, studies have shown that they actually have to convict themselves a little bit more once they hear that. That's good, yeah. So he asked the question. He saw something was wrong. Their understanding about who he was was wrong. A lot of people today may not do this. A lot of uh, men or preachers today, people who are seeking to, you know, elevate them to a place where they should not be, they'll gladly do that. Paul and Barnabas are humble in this whole interaction. No, 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 we're not God. Um, we're just men like you. And so again, you see this idea of humility, but you also see that Paul was willing to, he was willing to correct error. And so there was a misunderstanding about who he was in Barnabas. 
and he made sure that they understood, and he used that opportunity to teach them the truth. Uh, one of the things I like about Acts 14, uh, Stu, you mentioned it in Acts 17, it's very similar to what he's going to preach in Acts chapter 17. And this idea of talking about the true and living God and just the, the blessings that God gives to mankind um, and how he has not left himself without witness, but the good things that God has done, he's helping them to really understand your gods are false. The God that I'm preaching to you, he is true. Let me tell you the distinction between the two. And so making sure they understand the distinction of what is true and what is false. Uh, any other observations with that? Yeah, Kevin. I was just thinking, you know, verse 14, you know, when they, they heard this, they rent their clothes and ran among the people. Yes. Right? Uh, so there was clear emotion and power and passion uh, to me, I read it in, in that verse. And so, you know, sometimes today we, you know, if you, if you, if you think of the last 50, 60, 70 years and debates and the passion that preachers had, and contending for the faith, and oh, well, you can't be so passionate, you can't be so direct, you can't be so to the point. But what what did Paul do right mm-hmm. here? Right, he got he got right to the point. I can, yeah. It seems to me that it just wasn't just a simple, <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. <laughs> That's right. I think it shows yeah, passion. yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there's certainly there's certainly opportunity for us to do that, right? Where um, a misunderstanding about God, you're gonna you're gonna be going down you know, the wrong path all, all the time. And for them to view them as gods um, is certainly, um, so, certainly something he did not want them to do. Yeah, there's certainly nothing wrong about passion, especially as we think about souls that are, on the, that are at stake. Yeah, good. All right, let's look at another example here. Look at Acts chapter 16. This may be one of the more popular questions here. Where's Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16? With this story with the jailer, where are they? They're, they're, they're in uh, Philippi, in Acts chapter 16. Um, they're going to be in Philippi where, yeah, they're leaving uh, Lystra. Um, the second missionary journey has begun. And what we find here, they're going to have a, a, a question and answer. Uh, I'm sorry, I went to Acts 15. Uh, actually, go back. I got ahead of myself. Look at Acts 15. This one is important, too. Um, Acts chapter 15, we find Paul is now going back to uh, Jerusalem. And look at verse number one. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension, uh, Kevin, you're talking about zeal and passion. There's something going on here. Uh, And debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church, and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So the apostles and the elders came together to look into the matter. A very serious situation here uh, where whether or not uh, Gentiles needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. We have another example here with Paul and Barnabas where they're going to speak up, rightfully so. Uh, There's a great dissension Uh, There is debate that's taking place here. Uh, They are sharing the the good things that have taken place, reporting all that that God had done for them. Uh, The apostles, the elders, uh, the church is going to come together, and eventually they're going to resolve this issue. You look at verse number 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Bersabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They're going to send this letter to inform the Gentile brethren of expectations and what they need to do. So here we find a very serious encounter and uh, question and answer. There's certainly a lot of going back and forth, and there's a lot of lessons that we can take away from this. Number one, what, what I find that's interesting is that they were able to resolve the issue. All right. And so when uh, stakes are high, when there is something very important being talked about, 
How are we going to respond? Have you ever found yourself in a question and answer or there's something big that's taking place or something doctrinally? Well, can we resolve these issues from the, from the Word of God? And can we handle ourselves in such a way that even after we have studied and we've come to the right conclusion, that relationships can continue? Now, certainly if there are some who are opposed to the truth and um, who decide not to listen to the truth, but this matter had to be uh, discussed. And I find it interesting in verse 7, there had been much debate, and then Peter eventually uh, is going to, to stand up. The other thought that I have that I want to share with you with this example uh, is that Paul, Barnabas, Peter, the brethren as a whole, uh, they, had to, they had to listen, and they had to consider what everyone was saying. That's something important as we have discussions with one another, and even with individuals, uh, whether it's family members, people in the community, right? How well are we willing to listen and to understand and to make sure, no, this is actually what the Word of God says. So that becomes important as we interact with people as well. Uh, certainly we don't compromise the truth uh, just for the sake of, um, of, of you know, everything trying to be easy and comfortable. Uh, and they did not compromise the truth either. Uh, but this was a difficult situation that would have had some very serious ramifications uh, in the way that they uh, handled it and interacted um, the word of God would continue to prevail. Yeah. I mean, it was a brave thing to do, right? I mean, Peter was who's who of like apostles, right? Mm-hmm. He's been around since the beginning and he's, he's an all star team, right? <laughs> and so for him to stand up to him, he's a little newer in the faith, comparatively speaking to Peter. Are you talking about Paul standing up to Peter? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Galatians chapter 2. So, and, and help me out, did, did that also happen in Jerusalem at that time in Acts, or was that two separate occasions? Well, that's a great question. I believe... Okay, that's right. Yeah, Galatians chapter 2, verse number 11. Yeah, so he, had, he came to Antioch, so that seems to be two separate situations. But you are right, that's a great question and answer there, too. In that case in Galatians, I think that took a little courage from the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's about Paul, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and look, Peter here, he's standing up for what's right, right? And um, notice too, Paul and Barnabas, I love how they shared what was happening because they're talking about the conversion of the Gentiles. They're sharing these salvation stories. Look at what God is doing with the Gentiles. And so there's our evidence. No, God is working. Gentiles are being added to the kingdom of God. And the response was that it was bringing great joy. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, they are the ones who are saying, no, they still have to observe uh, circumcision under the law of Moses in verse number five. And so you you would think that that would have already been resolved by the time we get to Acts chapter 15. Uh, But there's a debate that arose uh, as a result of it. So yeah, I think that's two separate situations there. Uh, Schleyball? I was just thinking about how times in my life I've been guilty of hearing about something that's taught, maybe it involves somebody I know, I'm just kind of shaking my head, you know, that that happened. What stands out to me about Acts 15 is that there's a problem, that there's a teaching that's going on, and there's an effort to go and make a resolution. And, and going to the source, not just trying to just talk amongst themselves, you know, but let's go to the source and let's let's resolve this issue. You know, uh, that takes a lot of courage and conviction and really a lot of sacrifice. We have to take time and effort to go study it out ourselves and be ready to talk to people that may have a different perspective on things. And, uh, but it's a great example for us. Absolutely. Yeah, this wasn't just, uh, you know, one evening and then they moved on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Excellent. Yeah beginning of that, of Galatians 2, was clearly Acts, uh, Acts 15, right? So, um, as, it, as Paul went up by revelation to deal with this same issue, right? Of course, we drift into Antioch kind of the later part, but, but I think that yeah. the point here, he, he went up by revelation to deal with the false brethren. Uh, and, and the point was, was so that the truth of the gospel would not be perverted, right? Yeah. So that's, it all ties in with what everybody's saying. Mm-hmm. I mean, the beginning part of that. Yeah, the first part of Galatians 2. Yeah, those who had um, were seeking to, to spy on the brethren, uh, stealth mode. Yeah, 
All right, let's look at Acts 16. We've got a few more minutes left. Um, did I not put Acts chapter 16? I must have forgot that on the slide. Let's look at Acts chapter 16. Uh, this is important here. Um, this is the story of Paul with the Philippian jailer. And we don't have time to look at all the details, but it's an important um, discussion where you guys remember what the jailer did to Paul and Silas before they were thrown into, or as a result of being thrown into prison. Um, you know, he beat them, right? Uh, he's the one putting them in the prison. Look at verse 23. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. It, it would appear that he played some role with this, right? With putting them or striking them as well. Uh, so we know that there's going to be an earthquake that, that took place. And now we have someone else asking the question in verse number 29. Uh, the jailer believed that everyone had escaped, but Paul cries out, do yourself or do not harm yourself, verse 28, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he had brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Notice the response of Paul. They said, Paul and Silas, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. You know, as you think about this interaction here, the question is coming from the jailer. And the jailer certainly recognizes some things from Paul and Silas with his earthquake, what they had been teaching, how they had been singing and praying in prison as well. And there's a recognition of he sees something unique and different about them. And he asks them this question about salvation. Notice the reply of Paul and Silas. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Uh, that is biblical. He's not teaching them the sinner's prayer or anything like that. But this belief encompasses faith repentance, obedience to, to the gospel. Now, he didn't just stop there either when he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. In order for him to believe, what, what else had to happen? Well, he, he had to teach them. He had to know some things, right? And so it wasn't just, okay, here's your answer here. I'm done. No, he has to speak the word of the Lord to him uh, with everyone in his house. And so we can see this idea of what belief encompasses just within the context of, of hearing, uh, of understanding, uh, even this idea of repentance in verse 33, who's washing their wounds? It's, it's the jailer that's doing that. And now he, he's going to be baptized along with his family. I love this interaction, this Q&A, because there are people like that still today. What do I need to be saved? There's so much confusion in the world and Paul didn't try to sugarcoat. He didn't waste time. He got directly to, to, to the gospel. Something good for us. When we have these opportunities, capitalize on them. Teach them what the gospel is, believing in the gospel and how they need to respond. Paul did not shy away. Any, any other observations with this uh, particular uh, discussion that took place here? All right. So we just have a minute left. Um, there's actually a number of other conversations that we could look at. And one of the reasons why I just wanted to do this is to see in next quarter, Stephen and um, Stu are going to be teaching the book of Acts. There's so much to learn about how we interact with people. And whether it's Acts chapter 17, when Paul was in Athens, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite examples as, where, as well. Because the people are saying, listen, he's teaching something strange. And Paul is going to capitalize on these opportunities over and over again. Don't be shy to ask questions. Don't be shy to ask questions about a person's faith or what they believe. And also don't be shy to, to give an answer to what the Bible has to say. So we'll stop here. Uh, I appreciate the interaction tonight. Thank you for the study. And uh, if you guys have any